Okay, hello. Thank you very much for having me here, and I'm, I'm extremely grateful to have um, received the Glushko Prize. So I'm going to be talking about generalization in the hippocampal formation, and I'm going to briefly touch upon the tolman eichenbaum machine. So what we're interested in is how do we store models of the world? And in particular, we're interested in how we store relational models of the world. So how do we represent relationships between entities? So back in the 1940s, Edward Tolman um, came to the conclusion that animals did indeed represent relationships. Um, and so he did this by uh, a few remarkable experiments. One of which yeah, is he placed an animal um, in a maze and allowed it to navigate um, fairly randomly. And then at some point it, it reached a, 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 nice, um, a nice bit of cheese or a bit of reward. Um, okay, and so of course the animal is very happy to get that. And so next time he placed the animal um, back in uh, um, back in the environment, it thought to itself, oh, I'd quite like some cheese. And so what it could do is it could just repeat all the same actions that it did before, taking that torturous red path again, and it would get back to the to the cheese again, if, if it's still there, of course. Um, but if it actually understands something a little bit more about um, the world, um, it doesn't have to just repeat all the same actions. It can take a shortcut because it knows that you know some of the actions it took might have led it in a loop, for example. Um, and so what he found is these animals did take these shortcuts, and it really does um, deeply imply the animals actually store some functional model, internal model, which he named a cognitive map. Um, more recently, we've got a bit of an idea of how neurons in the brain um, represent this cognitive map. So, for example, um, down at the bottom there in the hippocampus, these place cells were found in the seven, in 1970s. And these are cells, this is a, one cell that we're, we're being shown here. And this cell fires at only a particular location in this box, indicated by this rate map. And right above that there is these things called grid cells and entorhinal cortex, which they now don't fire in just one location, but they fire in lots of locations. And those locations lie on this sort of triangular lattice, hence why it's called a, a grid cell. Um, so there's also um, lots of other cells in this um, brain region that also code for space. Things like object vector cells, which always fire at a certain distance and angle, so angle and orientation from objects, or border cells that fire um, at, at various borders. And in hippocampus, um, you think see uh, landmark cells, which are cells which look a bit like object vector cells, but they don't fire for every object. Okay, so while um, all of that work was going on. Um, there's a whole other sort of um, uh, 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 side of um, uh, understanding the hippocampal formation that was taking place. And that was um, really led by someone called Howard Eichenbaum, showing that the hippocampus is extremely useful for understanding um, or performing relational inferences. So for example, if I um, tell you that A is better than B, and then I also tell you that E is better than F, and I tell you that C is better than D, and B is better than C, and if I tell you lots of these pairwise, pairwise um, uh, um, uh, interactions, uh, then if I came along and asked you uh, what is better, B or E, even if you've never seen it before, if I haven't told you it already, you, you'll, you'll say, oh, I'd rather have B, because you're able to chain together all these pairs, um, pairs of bits of information. Um, and similarly, it's like if, you know, if Jane is stronger than Bob and Bob is stronger than Alice, etc., it implies that Bob is going to be stronger than, than Fred. So what Eichenbaum showed is that um, the hippocampal formation and, and um, I was crucially um, important in making these inferences that you've never seen before. So for example, if you lesion um, various inputs to the hippocampus, uh, animals can still answer these pairwise things that you've told them already. It can still answer, oh, I prefer B over C, but it can't do, I prefer B over D. It can't chain things together. Um, and again, there's also been shown that other sorts of inferential reasoning like um, uh, inferences of social um, social graphs or, and social hierarchies is also crucially dependent on the hippocampal formation. Um, even more intriguingly, a lot of the sort of cells that we saw that cared about space um, seem to actually care about non-spatial problems in a very similar way to how they care about space. For example, asking a rodent to hold a lever until a certain sound frequency appears um, is very non-spatial, it's got nothing to do with space, but yet if you look at cells, these are lots of cells here, they seem to code for sound frequencies a bit like they are places. So this is one cell that just cares, cares about um, one location there and another cell that cares about another location down there. Um, and also you see these sort of linear grid, linear um, sound grid cells that, that um, um, don't just code for one uh, sound frequency, but code for um, multiple frequencies. 
Um, and similarly, if you um, ask participants to um, uh, navigate a bird space where just uh, there's a bird on the screen and its neck length and leg length sort of morphs, but um, but you know, and those morphing trajectories actually actually take place in some bird space, but that participant only ever sees the bird. Um, they'll see activity in um, a sort of characteristic hexadirectional activity of grid cells um, found in uh, entorhinal cortex and, and medial prefrontal cortex. So this is really quite interesting because these are all non-spatial problems, but they're coded as if um, they were spatial. Okay, so this leads us to a few questions. Um, the first one is how on earth does relational inference work? Second is how is the same system um, performing both spatial and non-spatial um, uh, uh, problems? Well, how is it solving those problems? And lastly, why um, the cells that we that we saw earlier? Why do they look the way they do? Okay, so to start um, trying to answer this question, we're going to try and think about um, really trying to think about how what the problem that the brain is solving. Okay, so this is what we're interested in. If I um, uh, told you that Bob is Janice's brother and Alice is Janice's child, I've only given you two bits of information, but you're actually all able to tell me an awful lot more than that. You can tell me that Bob is Alice's uncle and Alice is Bob's niece. And you can tell me that because you've understood something about what a family tree is. You've understood how relationships add up with each other to mean the same thing. You know that parent plus brother is uncle, but brother plus parent is, is parent. Um, okay. But of course, um, just knowing um, rules for one family isn't, isn't so um, interesting. What we really care about is how do we um, take the same rules and apply them to multiple different situations. Um, and that's exactly what we can do. If we're able to understand that abstract notion of rules, um, we can come across this new family and immediately understand um, uh, the various relationships, um, or, you know, immediately understand this new family in the context of all these old relationships um, that we already know. Okay, so that's sort of the key uh, problem. We're trying to perform these relational inferences, and we're going to try and um, think about that by understanding some abstract quantity, the abstract quality of um, this relational backbone. Okay, that's going to bring us to the tolman eichenbaum machine. It's going to be um, a, ma uh, a machine that um, learns and generalizes this abstract relational knowledge. I'm not going to really go through any details because um, I won't have time, um, um, uh, but I'll try and show you that it, that it at least works and, and give you a tiny bit of understanding for, for the problem, um, the problem that we're going to charge this machine to solve. Okay, and that problem is sensory predictions. If I give you a stream of sensory um, stimuli and associated actions, for you know, light bulb, right, broom, down, etc., and then at the end I ask you to predict what comes next, that seems like a really hard problem. Um, but it becomes an awful lot easier if you've seen a lot of these similar or sequences drawn from um, similar worlds before. Um, because if you've done that, then you can abstract away um, the sort of particularities of, of each sequence and understand the common, um, the common um, abst uh, structural abstraction. And if you can do that, then you can see this a new stream of sens uh, uh, sensory stimuli, and you can place them onto this uh, um, this sort of backbone that you have in your mind. And so now we've seen that stream, and we can go light bulb, bright, broom down, etc. And then when we get to banana over here, I ask you what happens when you see after you go up, um, and you can tell me it's going to be the light bulb because you've understood that this we're now closing a loop, and a light bulb is something we've already seen. Okay, so hopefully we can predict the light bulb. Um, okay, so there's really two things um, that uh, uh, that a machine would need to solve this problem. The first one, first thing is it would need an ability to represent some abstract structure. So in the previous case, it would need the ability to represent some abstract quality of 2D space. And now it needs to represent some abstract quality of, of familiness. That's one thing. And the second thing is it needs um, uh, to be able to understand many, many different um, families it needs some notion of memory so that it can bind together, uh, in this case, that's that's Tim there, and it binds him to um, sort of one of these sort of nodes in the graph or sort of a representation of a node of a graph, and it can bind his children to the various other ones. But that same, um, it, but the, um, having a memory there means the very same back, um, uh, backbone could be used for a different family, for example. Okay, so two things. We want to be able to represent abstract structure, and then we need memories, okay? And so that's what this machine has. Like, again, I'm not going to go over any of the details exactly of how it works, but they're the two fundamental principles that are going on in this machine. Okay, so we can think about um, does it work, and, and uh, um, uh, that's what we're going to have a look about now. Okay, so if it worked, um, then uh, it should be able to well, it should be able to answer these sensory prediction problems, and in particular, it should be able to um, uh, do answer them as fast as possible. So, for example. 
if I was in this hexagonal world and I took this red torturous path all, all the way uh, around, once I'd got to that orange in the bottom right hand corner, I should actually know everything I need to know to um, help me make predictions because I've seen all the nodes of the graph graph, and I already hopefully understand the sort of structural hexagonal backbone of what's going on. Um, so therefore I should be able to infer any of the missing links even if I, if, you know, even if I haven't actually um, observed them already. Okay, so in, in you know, uh, practical terms, it means that if I'm running around on this graph, that my performance should go up the number of nodes I've seen, not the number of edges. And, and that's exactly what we've seen with this Tolman Eichenbaum machine. We're going to call it TEM here. Okay, and equally, if you show it these sort of family, family trees, it does rather well. But intriguingly, at the very, very beginning of training, here's this blue line. It's only ever seen one family tree before. It's, it's really kind of rubbish. I mean, it's got no idea what's going on. That's, of course, because it hasn't learned and extracted that fundamental backbone of what a family is. But after a while, after, you know, it's seen, uh, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, I, don't know, I, can't, I can't remember, many families, um, it gets really rather good. And immediately it understands, um, uh, 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 you know, it can walk, enter a family and immediately understand everything about what's, um, what it sees. This is learning to learn. Okay, so that's um, all nice, so it seems to work, but let's have a look at what these um, representations, this model um, learns. Okay, so first we're just gonna let it randomly wander around some space. And I know the spaces we are using are gonna be much, much bigger than this one. It's just um, just a, a small one to show you roughly what it would look like. Um, okay, so what we see is we see um, things that look like grid cells. Uh, and when those grid cells come in different frequencies, they come in different phases, and then we also saw, see band cells. These are all things we see in um, rodent and trinal cortex. Okay, that's just diffus diffusive behavior. What if we um, let this model behave a bit more like a rodent? So rat rats like hanging, that, hanging near walls or approaching shiny objects. But intriguingly, because that changes the transition prob probabilities, it will change the optimal representations you need to solve these tasks. Okay, so if we do that, we get things that look like object vector cells. So these um, here, this, this, is, this is a cell here that responds, you know, always Four, four pixels north of, a, of an object, and this one always is five pixels uh, east of an object. Um, and again, that's exactly like um, object vector cells in the brain. And similarly, near borders, um, Tem learns border cell representations, just like border represent cell representations in the brain. So what really what that's saying is that all these funky cells that you saw earlier, although they all looked very different, they all um, have the same underlying computational principles. Or we, you know, um, that, and that's trying to act as a basis set for learning and inferring transitions in worlds. Okay, if we have a look in um, uh, um, the equivalent of this machine's hippocampus, we see things that look like place cells, you know, with small ones, big ones, and that's just like the brain, small place cells, big place cells. And you also see things that look like landmark cells, just like in the brain. Okay, so I've, um, I've told you that we find all these cells, but uh, really what we're interested in is generalizing. We wanted, you know, for example, we want to see, um, the, can we learn the same set of rules that works for one family that also works for another family? Okay, but again, we're going to be looking at space here. And so on the top um, top row is all in world one and top bottom row is world two. And so we have lots of cells, which, you know, a grid cell in one, in one world is a grid, a grid cell in the other world, object vector cells in one world and object vector cells in another world, and border cells in one world and border cells in another world. They all generalize. Um, so you get some populations of cells that generalize, but then the memory representations, or sort of tem hippocampal representations, don't generalize. They, they are specific for each world. So we see they, they remap. Um, and it's confusing, confusing right now for the worlds on, 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 on the other dimension. But uh, so here's a place cell and it moves to a new location, and there's a bigger place cell and it moves to another location. And that's exactly like the brain. And it looks rather random. The question is, is it really random? But I should note here that people in the literature really think it is random, but actually this machine um, says it isn't. It says that there's some preserved information, even, even though hippocampal cells look like they remap the totally different locations. Um, okay, and so we test that prediction um, and in, in real data from two separate and independent studies, one in real space and one in actually um, a virtual reality, where the simultaneously recorded place in grid cells and we show you that uh, remapping isn't actually random, as you pre previously might have thought. Okay, so let's think about slightly more complicated tasks. Um, so um, someone did a very beautiful experiment where they got a rodent to run uh, around the lap uh, 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 on a loop, um, they, but intriguingly, they, they um, only rewarded it every four laps. 
Okay, so what does this machine say? It says if you want to make sensory predictions, you need to, you better have representations that care about space, because space repeats itself every lap, but you also need predictions that know about representations which know about which lap you're on, because um, to predict reward, because reward only repeats every four laps. So there's a mixture of spatial and non-spatial stuff. And that's exactly what, so here's what 10 predicts on the left. And that's exactly what's seen um, in, in real data when uh, uh, um, Chen Sun um, and colleagues um, did this experiment. Obviously, they actually did this experiment before us, hence why we got the idea to do it. Um, and so they see cells which uh, care about, you know, it says a lap one cell and a lap two cell, and there's a sort of ramping cell. So that's rather fun. Um, and uh, they also did a very beautiful remapping experiment as well. And so what does Thames say about remapping? It says, well, spatial cells remap. Um, they will you know, not totally, not randomly as you know as we know, but they still look like they remap randomly, and that's the blue stuff there. And then uh, it says that the non-spatial cells don't remap in the sense if you, you care about lap one, um, you'll still care about lap one. You might remap spatially, but you'll still care about lap one, um, and that's exactly what um, they find um, as well um, in the in the real data. Okay, so that's a bit of a whistle stop over over this. Um, and in summary, I try to uh, hopefully you will convince you that relational reasoning and space are, are, are the same thing. Um, and in the brain, what it's doing, it's um, extracting a relational structure and representing it abstractly. Um, that these enterhinal cells are a basis for representing transition structures. And hippocampus, um, hippocampal remapping is not actually random. Instead, relational structure is preserved. Okay, well, thank you very much for listening and thank you to all my collaborators.